Good afternoon, everybody. I am back. It's Sinead with Free Tours by Foot London. Excited for another season of 2024. Coming up, so many new neighbourhoods we have yet to explore, including today, where I'm starting in Fitzrovia. So here we have, you guys, the wonderful Fitzroy Square. And the square itself is named after the Fitzroy family who used to own the land here. And the origins of the family's wealth and influence actually began with a chap called Henry Fitzroy, which was one of many of Charles II, the Merry Monarch's illegitimate children. Henry became the Duke of Grafton, and we will see ref references that, as the name suggests, you'll see Grafton Street coming up very shortly. And always, I always tell people that. Always keep an eye on the street's names around you. They tell you so much about the history in the area. Um, but he then himself, a subsidiary title, became known as the Earl of Euston uh, in Suffolk. So that is where Euston Station, of course, takes its name as well. Now, this beautiful laid out square is a very typical Georgian square. And you can just imagine the high society and the people that would have wandered around here. And one in particular that's quite famous up here, and we're going to see quite a few residences today, of Charles Dickens, see a few also, of George Bernard Shaw, the famous writer. And this beautiful residence up here was at one time the home of George Bernard Shaw, later to be the home of the fem feminist radical. Actually, she's been studied by so many feminist groups and over the years, in fact, she would give their present Gen Z a run for their money. The incredible Virginia Woolf, lived here as well, the novelist and critic. To this day, her works are being sought after and studied by feminist groups all over the world. Her lifestyle was quite hedonistic. She became part of a Bloomsbury set up here, an artistic group who were sexually fluid, shall we say, and quite liberal in their views. And later on, we'll be showing you, talking a bit more about where they used to drink and where they grew set up their own artistic and po poetic kind of literary society inside in the very famous Fitzroy Tavern. This is, but there you have it, Virginia Stephen, originally, until she married her husband. Uh, Virginia Woolf lived in here from 1882 to 1941. And George Bernard Shaw, a part of that, lived in this house from 1887 to 1898. From the coffers of his genius, he enriched the world. Now, Fitzrovia, quite bohemian in nature, but has been known for years for its legacy and its association with literary greats and artists. Beautiful art galleries, gorgeous artisan delis. Now it has a close association, of course, with creatives. Um, I find it a bit more relaxed than the actual Soho vibe. I feel like there's an older kind of a habitant here that has lived here for years and they're very fortunate to live in this beautiful part of town. But where we actually are located is the district is bounded by the north of Euston Road. It's to the east of Tottenham Court Road. That'll feature today on the tour as well. To the south of Oxford Street and the west of Great Portland Street. Um, this is Robert Adam, very famous architect, also lived in this house. I've seen more blue plaques in this area than I have in probably any other square in London. Now, it'll all feature these beautiful, elegant townhouses today that we'll be talking about some of the most famous squares in London. And even though we've just seen the architect, uh, Robert Adam, actually, um, coincidentally, it was his square was designed by his brothers, James, and William Adam, and it was developed from the 1790s. Now, this is a rather interesting statue here as well. This gentleman looks quite dapper here, and this, in fact, is General Francisco de Miranda. And here you will see he lived here at 58 Grafton Way from 1802 to 1810. Now, he was a Venezuelan revolutionary and a flamboyant, actually, adventurer. He looks quite flamboyant, doesn't he, in his dress, almost dandy-esque, if you like. A revolutionary and flamboyant adventurer 
who fought for the independence of Spain's South American colonies and died in the Spanish jail, actually, in, as it says there, in 1810. So that will be of significance to our Venezuelans and our South American viewers as well today. Now, interestingly enough, I've heard so many amazing reports about this YMCA, but I didn't even know that there was such a thing as this is an Indian YMCA. If you're looking for some excellent Indian, Indian food at an incredibly cheap price, they have amazing lunches in there. Today's special is chili chicken in there. And I'm assuming all profits go to the running of the establishment. But um, I've heard so many people raving about this for a taste of authentic Indian cuisine at an affordable price. And it always seems to be quite busy there, guys, as well. Definitely make our way and pop in here to the YMCA. That looks absolutely delicious. Is that like a dal or a tikka masala maybe or something? Yeah, I'll be checking that out. Look inside, you can see those samosas. Okay, so quite charitable as well. Now, of course, the imposing building directly above us is what is known as the BT Tower, formerly known as the Post Office Tower. On the top, you'll see they have electronic advertising. It was originally a rooftop restaurant, the highest rooftop restaurant in London at the time. And it was a revolving restaurant. Apparently it took like 23 minutes to fully revolve at the top of the BT Tower. I'm personally not a huge favorite. It's a telecommunications tower now. It's wishing us today a happy Valentine's Day right up here. Today is February the 14th, 2024. You used to be able to access the top of the tower, but that closed down. I believe there was a terrorist attack in there in the 1970s. And that was the end of the restaurant section up there. Now, as you can see, we're passing some amazing places to eat along the way as well. We have gaucho, there's Italian Uno is up there. It's probably one of the most authentic Italian restaurants in the area. It's really delicious in there. And a proper sandwich, one that I haven't had for a long time from here. But look at these beautiful little quaint houses along here, guys. We're heading down what's called Scala Street. And we will be seeing a beautiful little residential area as well, off the beaten track. Um, nowadays, they're kind of occupied with a lot of creatives, like copywriters, uh, recording studios, artists, um, advertisers and execs. A very young group of people hang out and work around here. And you will see why very shortly. It's got a huge amount of bars down here. But very trendy ones as well. Very cool and old school bars. Um, there was a group actually founded by Virginia Woolf and her brothers and artistic friends of her brothers. And they were called the Bloomsbury Group. It's basically kind of a loose artistic association which had its origins in a society in Cambridge University. Um, she herself attended the female section of King's College for a period of time where she studied the classics and Victorian history. But their artistic endeavours and sexual adventures around London, moving around London, became legendary, the Bloomsbury Group. At one time, Henry James actually described this area. They favoured this area because, well, I think partially because Henry James had suggested, the famous author and writer, that the area had become antiquated and an ex-fashionable area, which suited the Bloomsbury group. I had originally came down here, you guys, to show you this beautiful museum, and it's so sad. This is Pollock's Toy Museum, Benjamin Pollock Toy Museum, and it was so wonderful inside there. It was just full of all Victorian toys, but um, unfortunately, it's closed down, so there's not much I can do about that. But um, if you're interested in Benjamin Pollock's toy shop, you can check out a couple of my Covent Garden tours where I've ventured inside there. They do wonderful puppets and there's quite a scary doll museum downstairs. Some of those old Victorian dolls were terrifying. They're almost, I don't know, satanic-esque even. Now, we're coming along here and this will take us out here onto 
we're on Tottenham Street right now, but I wanted to bring you across here to show you Tottenham Court Road. And there's something rather curious, especially for my American customers. We're going to head over here, which has association with General Eisenhower. Now, it is lunchtime in the area, so I expect it's going to be quite busy. We're going to make our way down here. Now, this is the Fitzrovia mural, which is absolutely beautiful, and it kind of talks a lot about the types of people that lived here and the activities that took place here over the years. But it's a wonderful work, and again, framed in the background by the BT Tower. Now, we're taking a little detour here. I'm going to cross over. I'm going to take you down Cheney Street. Now, these curious round buildings were used actually... Uh, well, they're now used for storage, actually, but they're the only visible part of a deep underground headquarters of General Eisenhower. Now, the extensive underground buildings underneath here as well were later used as an army transit camp until the mid-1950s and co could hold up to 2,000 men right underground here. The Eisenhower Centre, even though it remains... Um, still close to the public but it's a rather curious looking building with the remains inside now general eisenhower himself of course commanded the troops from the uh, eisenhower suite in the dorchester if you're familiar just above the dorchester and that's where he stayed to this day it's known as the eisenhower suite it's one of the most exclusive suites inside the dorchester and let's what take a little detour down whitfield street here show you this gorgeous little tranquil oasis we have the spaghetti house every type of food you can imagine is sold down here Japanese Italian Lebanese I've seen of course Indian South Indian Turkish delis Greek pancakes falafels look at this gorgeous little oasis you guys and how pretty is this little back street how I would absolutely love to, to live here. Now, Crabtree Fields is the name of the little private garden space here in the oasis for the public, it looks like. Look at these gorgeous little homes. This is Colville Place in Fitzrovia. These gorgeous. Now, I'd love to see these flowers and plants in full bloom, but it is February, so not long yet. March is officially spring here in London. But it feels like a spring day today. It's quite mild, you guys. Aren't these beautiful? But the quiet, can you imagine what that Victorian lamp is like at night time when you walk down here when it's in full bloom? Let's take a little detour in here temporarily just so I can show you the type of garden space and oasis you can get. Isn't this beautiful? Just escaping the world. This is Crabtree Fields. There's a little playground for your kids. Just a hidden oasis right here in the middle of Fitzrovia. So I'm going to head back out again and give these people on their lunch break a bit of peace. But it just shows you how quiet and peaceful areas can be off the side of London. Look how house proud these people are. Imagine what these are like in the summertime if it wasn't such a dull day, but I feel like it's going to threaten to rain, but that's a great... That's actually great for where I want to go next, because I'm going to take a little pit stop into what I found to be one of the most beautiful pubs in London. Wait until you see the inside of what's called the Fitzroy Tavern. So this takes us back out on here to Queen Charlotte Street, named after the wife of King George III. Give you an idea of where we are. But down here, right on the corner, one of the most famous pubs with a little bit of dark history as well. Oh, look at this for Valentine's Day. 
it's pretty nice. It's the biggest day of the year for florists, of course. They're lovely. And chat there. We'll be in the good books tonight, my lovelies. Okay. Let's head inside here. A beautiful hotel across there, the Charlotte Street Hotel as well. But I'm finally delighted that I get to have a look around Fitzrovia and bring you with me. So it is like Soho. But you know, there's something better about the vibe here. I really like it here. I don't know. It seems more village type, if you like. It's kind of like a little village in the middle of central London. And this will be our next stop here on the corner of Windmill Street and Charlotte Street. So welcome to the Fitzroy Tavern, which can rightly claim to be London's greatest bohemian intellectual and literary haunts. Uh, I suppose it was particularly most popular between the 1920s and the 1950s, when the Bloomsbury Group actually hung out here. But not only that, some incredible artists, writers, poets, musicians, comedians over the years. Some of the more famous visionary characters that spent time in here would have included George Orwell, Michael Bentine, the playwright and author George Bernard Shaw, artist Walter Sickert, Augustus John, and in more recent years, it became quite popular with the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas and the incredible comedian Tommy Cooper. Um, another one of the darker residents that used to frequent in here was a chap called Alistair Crowley. Now, Alistair Crowley was famous as being a Satanist, actually. He was known as the Great Beast 666. And the rumor is he invented a satanic cocktail inside in this establishment in the Fitzroy Tavern. And it was called the Kubla Khan Number no. 2. And that cocktail was a heavy blend of gin, vermouth and laudanum, which would have been a form of opium and a tincture of opium, which would have contained about 10% powdered opium. This is what they used to drink inside here. But we're going to take a little look inside, because I want to show you how beautiful it is in there. And they're quite happy for us to have to film in there. So bear with me. I just wanted to take you upstairs. You got a bit peculiar about filming, so I need to do this quite quickly. <laughs> You guys, but I wanted to show you some of these incredible people. There's Walter Sickert, of course, the painter and customer of the Fitzroy Tavern. Walter Sickert, of course, was the closely connected to the Jack the Ripper case. Uh, Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence and Avon, actually worked in this area, the grandson of Queen Victoria. And he had been bizarrely claimed to be one of Jack the Ripper's, a suspect in the Jack the Ripper case. These incredible pictures. Now I wanted to show you just how beautiful it is up here. Look at this. Isn't this wonderful? See some of the pictures over here. That's Walter Sickert. A couple of others there, there's Virginia Woolf. Jacob Epstein, and of course that amazing picture there of George Orwell. So you have uh, so much beautiful space up here to have a drink. It's almost like an elegant library, isn't it? Let's see what we've got over here. Henry Fussell, Ford Maddox Brown, Wyndham Lewis. Look how beautiful. I'll keep this on your list, you guys. It's an amazing place to visit. And it's just, they have amazing food here as well. And apparently the mussels are spectacular here. Something that's very rare in London nowadays, an open fire. I mean, what an amazing place. It's like you're upstairs in someone's house. Look at this wonderful special room, then like a little library. Mm -hmm. There's a lovely couple here, and I don't want to invade their privacy. 
They didn't expect someone coming in here with a camera on top of them. But alas, it's beautiful. And here is Dylan Thomas and a quote from Dylan Thomas that reads, a good poem is a contribution to reality. The world is never the same once a good poem has been added to it. A good poem helps to change the shape of the universe, helps to extend everyone's knowledge of himself and the world around him. Dylan Thomas. How beautiful in this little quaint library area. I'll just give you one last look. Just trying to be respectful of these lovely people here beside me. <laughs> How lovely. Just met the most wonderful couple who have obviously been married for maybe 20, 30 years and they're heading out to a theatre date after having a wonderful lunch here on Valentine's Day. How lovely. So in the 1930s and the 1940s, the Fitzroy Tavern was a hub for many of the leading creative and literary figures of the day. The likes of George Orwell, Dylan Thomas and Augustus John. And we've just seen some of his work there, his painting of WB Yeats, regularly met here to enjoy its convivial and bohemian atmosphere. Look at this, ladies and gents. Now, this is actually open to the public. It's not a private room. Can you imagine having a hot brandy or a hot port here in the middle of the winter and just sitting by the fire? The wonderful bartender here as well. He's so sweet and knowledgeable about the actual pub itself. What a beautiful hidden gem. So keep that on the list, the Fitzroy Tavern here on Queen Charlotte Street in Fitzrovia. And just up here, of course, the oh, beautiful Dylan Thomas. A quote from him, a good poem is a contribution to reality. The world is never the same once a good poem has been added to it. A good poem helps to change the shape of the universe, helps to extend everyone's knowledge of himself and the world around him, Dylan Thomas. And some of the more famous pictures here. Dylan Thomas with his wife, Cortland. And we have Dylan Thomas again. Oh, it's all Dylan. What a wonderful tribute to Dylan Thomas. Pubs of London, ladies and gents. Incredible pubs of London. What an incredibly beautiful place, you guys. So pleased I get to show you these bits in London. Now, there is another pub down here as well, which has literary connections. In fact, it's said to be where George Orwell met his wife down here. And that's the Wheat Chief. And it became a bit too trendy for the Fitzrovia, the Fitzroy Tavern became a bit too trendy for George Orwell. He thought, you know what, it's been overdone, overhyped now, too many cool people hanging out there. So he moved him and his friends down to this section, which is called the Wheat Chief Pub. Now, it's not so much, and I know that some people think that I'm obsessed with pubs, but it, it's not even that there's an obsession with pubs. It's more about it's such a huge part of British society, and indeed Irish society. And pubs aren't all just for drinkers. I mean, a lot of people head to pubs, not just for alcohol, but for company and for great food in London. So never feel pressured here. There's a lot of pioneers and teetotalers that don't drink as well. Now this one is quite bizarre, the history here. It was in 1912, actually, at number four, lived a chap called, and I'll have to get this, Alois. Alois Hitler, ladies and gents, who was, I believe, a half-brother of Adolf Hitler, lived in this building, and it is rumored he was at one time visited by his brother inside here at number four. Terrifying to think that one of the most evil men in history. Well, we've a bit of a theme today, including Alistair Crowley, um, would have visited inside this very building here. Well, let's have a quick look at the Wheat Chief, which is just around the corner here. And we see two of the circular plaques here. She may let me just film the inside of it as well. I just wanted to show you. They're old school pubs as well. So look at this amazing little place. I guess it's so hard to find places to develop your old school film. I mean, I'm still of that, I'm of that generation where you could still wait to get your pictures taken. And you had that dread or that fear of how bad they would turn out. Whereas nowadays, all you have to do is edit and delete. It's crazy, isn't it? Okay, so this is the Wheat Chief. Another 
historic London pub here. And again, we're Dylan Thomas in 1914 to 1953 drank here. And George Orwell. It's rumoured he met his wife in here, actually. Just see if they'll allow me to take a bit of footage inside. But look at this wonderful door. Stunningly beautiful. It's the back entrance. Look how beautiful. Now, as I'm crossing Tottenham Court Road, you guys, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a lesser known, but no less tragic event that took place on Tottenham Court Road. And the year was 1814. It was on October the 17th. What sounds like a rather fun event actually turned out to be a horrible tragedy. So it centered around a huge vat of beer actually exploded, containing about 135,000 gallons of beer ruptured at the new brewery on Tottenham Court Road. This caused other vats to do the same and in kind of a domino effect, it led to about 325,000 gallons of beer gushing into the surrounding streets and in the surrounding area all the way down to Great Russell Street. The resulting wave destroyed two homes, knocked down a wall at the Tavistock Arms pub and it trapped a young employee by the name of Eleanor Cooper under the rubble. The flood spread all around the slum area at the time, which would have been the St. Giles area, where people were tightly packed together in some of the worst third world slums known to humanity at the time. And they were tight. The flood kind of surrounded and consumed these homes. The homes filled with beer and at least nine people either died or drowned from their injuries. And one was reported um, to have died from alcohol poisoning. So the brewer was subsequently taken to court, but would you believe the disaster was ruled as an act of God, leaving nobody responsible? And it took weeks for the strong smell of beer to be removed from the area. Now the flood was of course a bonus for some. Uh, there's always opportunity for some people in other people's difficulty. And a lot of the locals actually ran out carrying kettles, pans and pots to scoop up as much beer as they possibly could at the time. So lesson known fact about Tottenham Court Road, and that was a rather tragic London beer flood on the 17th of October, 1814. Now continuing on, our next stop is going to be today is heading towards Bedford Square. Now we're taking a detour down Bailey Street and that'll bring us down towards one of the most elegant squares in London. This is Bedford Square. Been used in several period dramas over the years in movies and films. To uh, laid out actually between 1775 and 1783 and it takes its name from the Russell family who were the most senior members of the Dukes of Bedford. But look at this, so this is what this whole part of London is all about, is elegantly laid out squares right in the heart here of heading in very closely towards the area known as Bloomsbury. Look at this beautiful oasis. Now, like everything else, however, though, these gardens are private gardens, they're usually reserved the gardens uh, laid out uh, especially for the residents or the workers in the area because as expensive and as beautiful as these townhouses are they usually don't have their own private gardens so these key gardens or key squares are only exclusively open to the residents in the area and they're all provided with keys to these gardens you'll be familiar with this and I've spoken about this several times around Belgravia and Eaton Square in the movie where you see Richard, e, Richard Grant, or Hugh Grant, my apologies. I'm thinking of Whitnell, Richard E. Grant. Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts famously climb over one of the key squares in the movie Notting Hill. Now, famous past residents of this area would have included the Prime Minister, Herbert Asquith. He lived at number 44. Lutyens, or Edward Lutyens, very famous for the, well, built the Cenotaph, the most important British war memorial in the world dedicated to every fallen soldier from any British conflict. That one is situated, of course, on Whitehall. I think he was responsible for the layout of Trafalgar Square, as far as memory serves. And Sir Henry Cavendish, 
the famous scientist lived here in another one of these beautiful squares. Look at some of these buildings. Now, now tend to be offices and embassies, mostly because uh, rent would not be, but you could see would not be affordable, shall we say, to many people in London in this area. But you, you can see the horse-drawn ponies and the traps and many movies would have been filmed around this atmospheric location. And that is going to take us down a bit further into the busy streets. When we get out of Bedford Square, we're going to make our way down Gower Street here. And eventually, we're going to head into the heart of Bloomsbury, which is famous for its academic universities, the University of London, museums, the British Museum. We'll be talking a little bit today about the Grant Museum. And Great Ormond Street Hospital is down here. So, so this is a wonderful part of London that we're discovering together, folks. So, I will see you there next week. Sinead here with Free Tours by Foot London, signing out.